Hi, welcome to another UH Studio Architecture podcast episode. In this episode, we have Ping Shang Chen, who works as a senior architect at Zaha Hadid Architects, and he's also a computational designer. Ping Shang is very unique because he has one foot clearly in architecture and architectural design and understands the importance of it, and the other foot in computational design as a computational design leader who works directly with Rhino teaching Grasshopper MC Sharp courses. Ping Shank and I collaborate quite a bit, so we see a lot of things in the same way in regards to architectural design and computational design. This is a fairly long episode, but it's quite densely packed with some of Ping Shang's great ideas and expertise, so make sure you stick through it, especially in the second part where Ping Shang talks about his life project at the moment at Zaha Hadid Architects and how he has developed a very unique computational workflow to take a concept design and turn it into design development project that could be used for planning, it could almost be used for construction. This podcast episode does come with subtitles, so if you happen to be listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts, you're welcome to check it out on YouTube with the subtitles on. Ping Xiang is currently a senior architect at Zaka Hadid Architects, and prior to that, he was the computational design lead at KPF. And prior to that, he worked as a designer and a computational designer, so both sides of the coin at Arthur Mamu Mami. So Ping Xiang, very nice to have you. And I know we had quite a bit of struggles with the technology. Thank you so much for bearing with us. And it's wonderful to have you on the podcast. Hi, Dimita. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm super happy to be here and very excited to what we are going to discuss. Great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, right? So you're originally from Taiwan, right? And then you did your studies at DAA. And then, I mean, I think you have two bachelors and two masters, right? So you've done quite a bit of studies throughout the world, which is fantastic. I studied architecture design back in Taiwan, and then I didn't really finish it. It was a five years bachelor degree. I finished four years and then decided to move to the UK. But I didn't continue my bachelor at the time. I stopped a master program at University of Westminster straight away. And then once that was finished, then actually I went back to bachelor at the AA School of Architecture and then continue my diploma program, which is also a Another master program. Wow, that's so interesting. So right away, we get a very interesting peek into your character that you don't follow the typical rules. How did they let you do a master's before you had your bachelor's? That is a very good question. And actually, I didn't really know about that because at the time when I applied for my master, it doesn't really matter how many years you study because uh, two countries have completely different standards and then also criteria. So at the time, it's really more about portfolio. And then I basically present a few works to them. It was not really like a typical sort of registration process because I was like contacting the dean at the time saying that, okay, I'm interested in this. Is this the right school? I should go and so on. And then they start this conversation with me and then they accept me. In your studies or after your studies, it seems like you gained a strong appreciation for parametric design. And then you started using that in different ways. So I actually started my parametric modeling or design journey back in Taiwan. So when I came here, I didn't study any of them. So yeah, it's just something that I, I, I feel really passionate about. And also I see a potential at the time. But however, like the reason I studied in so many different programs is really to explore a completely different things. I, I don't study the same thing. They are completely not computational, I have to say, when I study at the AA School of Architecture. But at the same time, I work for a number of small companies and doing collaboration with them. So that also extend and continue my journey of that after I relocate to the UK. So it's very interesting then that you had a very strong awareness of parametric design and then decided to go into different architectural design directions and explore different ways of designing because we know each other fairly well, I think, at this point. And from my experience with you, you are a very well-rounded art design individual, right? So you've got a very strong design sense, but at the same time, a very strong parametric capabilities, which is unique in our profession. We either have people that decide to stick 
with design and maybe they know a bit of grass scope or some other tools a little bit, but they don't delve too deep into it. Or we have people that jump ship and they move completely to the computational design side of architecture where they focus completely on parametric design, more on the construction side or rationalization side of things. I guess you had that experience as well, right? Because when you went to KPF, were you completely on the computational design side of things? It's very interesting in a way how people understand computational design because nowadays computation is a common thing for people to categorize like a, a specific type of people or skills in a specific way just for the understanding in general. Therefore, when I joined KPF at the time, I actually didn't know that I will be categorized in this IT department or research department. Yeah, because I never see my Myself as a, a computational specialist. A computational design is really the way for me to articulate certain type of design or solve a certain type of problems. So I see myself more an architect rather than a technologist. When I discovered that I, I don't deal with architectural problems too much, I deal with just purely technical issues, geometry issues, software developments, and so on, then that kept me thinking of change because I think that without a well articulated problems, then the solution doesn't exist. That is why when I got a chance to switch, I emphasize the importance of the work scope that I will be involved rather than what kind of a job title I will get. It sounds like you always wanted to have one foot in strongly in design and parametric or computational design. It's just a means to execute your job as an architect better. Exactly. A computational designer, this title is a little bit misunderstood. I believe that most people get into this computational design not for the sake of learning or being a computer scientist. Because when I got into computational design or scripting, probably 15 years ago, uh, that is purely to uh, solve a particular problem that I couldn't solve uh, manually. And, and that is how I got into that. And after that, the reason I say I didn't really study any of that, because when you study, you explore different research direction. It's not necessarily to, to do scripting, to do programming, to, to do computational uh, design for the sake of implementing it to the process. It's really about how to solve stuff. And also I want to put an emphasis here is that computational design is not just about design. It's not just about design. That is also a very misunderstood term. What a computational design is about. We all love design. We, we all know that architectural design started from this kind of scenario-based logic in many ways. Computational design is a creative solution for the problem. And that applies to basically any phase of your design production. You can use computational design for designing, Graphic, I want to refer that to just purely graphic. For example, like we do a competition a lot, and that is a graphic, of course, a graphic generated with all sort of constraints, right? The context, the criteria, and so on. But eventually, what computer design play during that process is to generate graphic, right? Nothing more than that, okay? However, computational design in different phases, it's also about a communication, about articulating certain type of scenario to simulate stuff as well, or to optimize your design, make it feasible in a way that it can be fabricated and make, or it could be something that basically allow you to assess the risk management of your project. So I think computational design is not really about design, design graphic, because if you look at that purpose, probably a lot of software can do much better than, for example, Rhino Grasshopper. I would play the devil's advocate here a little bit, actually, because you raise a very interesting topic, computational design. What exactly is computational design? What is parametric design? And you say that it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, let's say, early concept projects, right? When we're doing some iterations or you find interesting shapes or patterns or facade patterns, but they're more graphical, right? We haven't worked out the detail. We haven't rationalized them yet. 
But that's also computational design, or maybe that's parametric design. Well, there's a couple of terms that we use almost as synonyms to one another, aren't there? Like parametric design, computational design, non-destructive design. There's quite a few terms being thrown out there. But there's, in a way, maybe a place for both. But I do agree with you that somehow parametric design has been misappropriated as a term to mean designing cool shapes, you know, and it definitely has a strong part to do that. But as you say, it's actually a tool that's very important for the other stages of the design process, which maybe don't look as sexy as like those initial images that people do. Yes, definitely, definitely, absolutely, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think if we look at parametric design in such a way, only produce graphic, you don't look at the true value of it, because this digital driven process actually it's a game changer for the way how the whole profession is perceived graphically. If you try to value that process, how much? Probably the direct link is okay. If you win the project, or if you don't win the project, right? But if you try to look at every the value of every stage of your work, then you can start understanding what it really means by linking to the data driven process. Because a lot of time it's to do with resource, it's it's to do with risk management, is to communicate the information with other to make certain kind of process more transparent and so on. So if we look at only the graphical part of the design, then the value of computational design is not really understood correctly. In your experience then these days, how many people do you think actually not only understand, but have the capabilities to utilize computational design techniques, workflow, data workflows to progress designs further. Is that sort of a very niche capability at the moment? Or do you see more and more people, maybe more colleagues around you that, that have those capabilities? I cannot really comment on how many people who do things in a very similar way to myself, how very similar to my education. I always try to do something different. I don't like to repeat the same thing I do. Therefore, for me, during different stage of my career, I basically try to participate in a completely different role in whatever process it is. Therefore, computational design or computational strategy is always the way how I try to articulate problems within that process. Uh, and therefore, I somehow got a wide range of experience applying computational design strategies in those different processes. And therefore, that gave me the, these ideas about what I think the computational design is. And you know, if you work in a company that heavily focuses on design, of course, uh, that is uh, apparent. You might only think that computational design is all about uh, creating exciting geometries. That could be. Right, And if you work in a company that doesn't focus too much on the geometry aspect of the software or platform or process, then maybe it's all about environmental simulation. It could be it's all about extracting data, understanding the data with a certain process. And if you are working more for maybe design, but design and build uh, companies, then maybe computational design is really about managing risk, managing a budget, managing a schedule and so on. So it really depends on how you bring a computational design on board in the process or in the work scope that you work on. And yeah, I am quite fortunate to have all these different opportunities in the past. And that also become a very important way I work now the day. So I don't focus on a particular process. I might focus on design or architecture solution in the office, but I do a lot of teaching. And then I focus on other aspects, which I think uh, computational design also play a very important role. And so all these kind of a mixed experience, uh, that helped me a lot. And in Zaha, 
is Akakadir Architects. Can you talk a little bit more about your role as both an architect and how computational design has helped you with your projects? If you can talk about your projects, I don't know if they're at a phase where they're public yet or not. Right. I wouldn't be too specific on which project that I work on and how I apply certain processes because, as I say, it's all to do with the problem I'm trying to solve. But my role in Zaha basically is more about handling the project from SD stage to CD stage. So that means the geometry aspect of the or the design aspect of the project, which I got involved a bit less. But however, at the same time, I got all control over design and geometries just because you have to make it feasible for construction. So the design development actually involved from that point after you got a kind of initial concept and then try to rationalize it or try to bring the project forward. My role at Zaha Hadi is mainly to realize design that has been approved at the moment. Yeah, so that is my role. And at Zaha, for the audience that may not know, I believe there's specific teams that work on competitions. And if the competition is won, then those the members get asked if they want to continue with the project onwards, or many prefer to work only on competitions and then different teams handle the project after the competition has been won to develop the design further. Yes, that's correct. So in your role again at Zaha, so it's basically about rationalization, right? You, ha you have this pretty building, now we have to make it more real, right? We have to have the number of panel A, panel B, panel C. Does the shape kind of change when you're doing that kind of rationalization? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So it's about design development. So every stage of the design development basically make the project more realistic, right? And making it more realistic, that means all sorts of things that need to be adapted. Therefore, when you work in a DD stage, detailed design or design development, then you really try to understand a lot of the things that you probably don't think about when you work at the concept stage. Therefore, your design naturally just get change here and there. Design change all the time. Design change all the time. But the design intention and also the design con concept maintain. And something we forgot to mention in the beginning is that you actually also work with Rhino, right? So you teach workshops with Rhino, with McNeil, yes. uh, the guys that make Rhino throughout the world. So you definitely have a very strong computational design capabilities, you know, that are useful for also for other architects now as well to learn. How do you see education changing then for architects and designers? Do you see the importance of more people being capable of some computational design capabilities or at least being aware that it's out there because perhaps it could influence the way they approach design? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I see education in many ways. I, I have been using the software Rhino Grasshopper for minimum 13 years. I start with Rhino 3 and then oh, it's, it's already Rhino 7, right? And Grasshopper came out in 2008, I believe. It was called explicit history at the time, but I actually stopped that kind of a parametric or scripting process before that. What I see is also linked to what I explained a little bit earlier regarding this notion of computational design. Because I see that people get into the software mostly for the first step, doing something they couldn't do before. And that aspect is more to do with geometry generation. It's more to do with making exciting geometry. But in most of the course I do, I actually try to teach people about what is computational design, what is computational thinking, and then why you really need that, rather than teach a command-based software. So you don't just go through people, A command, B command, C command, and what this software is about. The way I teach is more about telling people why and what the context that you should consider and then you should understand the process of this computational tool. Because one 
big difference between the software today and the past is that the past thinking about these primitive geometry capability and then he basically give this capability to the software engineer uh, to create but now it's more personalized it's more customized and you can do it in many different ways you can apply it to many different contexts and therefore understanding what it really means to a specific context and problem is essential and that is also down to how you invent your own problems to solve. So for instance, uh, people might choose uh, standard uh, comments from the comment bar like uh, to start the initial geometry when they decide. It, it's about what kind of things that you are going to do after war, then you choose that particular process to start. Therefore, it's important to articulate those things and really try to understand different issues as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I am quite lucky to be able to work in so many different fields. That is also because of the education, because in particular for manual ed education, people are not from architecture mainly. Um, people are from all different professions. They bring in questions and they bring in their own expertise to the course and they are all tied to this software. So that inspired me a lot, right? Talking about geometry problem, then I actually learn a lot between, for example, like product design or auto automotive um, design versus architecture and urban design, even just between architecture and urban design. Actually, the way the software is understood is completely differently. Yeah? And when we talk about those geometry tools inside Rhino, you're talking about surface in automotive design and architecture. That is completely different thing. And therefore, that's why I refer those software to a creative solution because it's really to do with what kind of problem that you are trying to uh, tackle and how you can get there. It's not really a about you using a specific command to do it. You know, we always say that software is so flexible. You have million ways to achieve something, but that is not true. When you look for a specific quality, then they are specific commands for you to choose. But apparently those software make for designers mostly. So a lot of people will focus more on the graphical aspect. And there, the part that I mentioned earlier got missed out a little bit. And this is where those kind of technologies actually came in because they have a deeper understanding of the software and therefore they know how they can potentially rationalize the geometry. But what I found is that quite often we as a technology, especially when I played the role in the previous company as a technologist, we are actually looking at a different or completely wrong problem. Yeah, because the software wasn't understood correctly, the problem wasn't under, understood correctly, and we only look at the, the graphical aspect. And therefore, the problem down the line is not the right problem to solve, and you can only solve that a certain problem to a certain extent. It's completely the directional things. When you go to the wrong direction, you, the way you come back is really limited. I totally get it, right? The way that most architecture software is used is more for the design part of the exercise, not so much for design development. And that has to do with the biggest player in architecture, software Revit, in a way, doesn't it? Because it has very strong limitations of a design concept and helping the designers without any scripting or without the Rhino into turning that project into something that can be built. Of course, if it's just a, an extruded tower where all the panels or all the facade is quite the same, it's fine. But once you get into and you work at Zaha, so you know every building there is twisting a little bit, that's not a standard project. So you can't just plug this into the tool that there's a, basically a requirement for every architect to know these days and expect some output out, right? You have to script things. You have to play around with things to get it to work in the right way. So is there a point do you see that software is getting a little bit smarter at least and maybe more user-friendly so people don't have to script everything? Or do you imagine in the near future, because who knows, in 20, 30 years time from now, we're going to have Autodesk GPT where you ask AI to maybe design it, who knows. But for the near future, do you see the importance of teaching more 
people about the capabilities of computational design? Or do you see the software actually catching up to the demands of the profession and them adding smarter tools that help solve those problems? I think a bit of both. It's important to learn the command and function of a software to know the capability of it, the strength and weakness of it. But it's equally important to understand the software you are using because you have a deep understanding of it and therefore you know what kind of process that you can implement and what kind of problems you can tackle with that specific software. Because in architecture, I believe that with any kind of software that is still quite new in the profession, considering the whole architectural history, right? Probably the first 3D software, 2D software came out back in 90, right? And that is really the bloom of how we start using digital process for the stuff. It's been 20, 30 years, but it's still pretty new, I have to say. And now, software came out, for example, this parametric modeling tool came out. It's a game changer now because of the way you can you can do things more flexibly. It's also to do with how the authority is given to people because of this open source of a spirit at the time. People start being able to customize it in the way they use the software. It's not like what I described earlier. All the function is created by a software engineer who might know better about mathematics, about geometries, about how computer science works, but doesn't know any of the design or architect, for instance. But now, because of this openness of the software, people start being able to think about what the software is really good at, and then they can consider it as a creative solution tool. It's very important because otherwise you are limited. You are limited by a software that is not created for your own profession. For instance, when people choose a tool, it's all about making something similar to the idea, but it's not made for something that might be workable for that particular purpose. Therefore, you need you know, technologies who has better understanding of the technology to solve the problem. But again, because that problem has been initiated in completely wrong direction, therefore, whatever process attached to it down the line, you cannot fully resolve the problem. So it's more adding a little bit of additional problems and try to resolve it. So I think the software today is also to do with this openness for people to customize. And that brings the importance for people to understand the tools they use. If you look at, you know, for example, people who make cars and so on, they, they create their own tool all the time because they want to achieve a specific t uh, type of curve and therefore they have to really understand the tool but now we all get tools very easily sometimes we even complain about uh, like uh, the license and so on and try to get it easier uh, away from it it's very important that you, you try to understand your tool try to appreciate the tool that can really help you deal with problems yeah, it's not really about efficiencies. Of course, efficiency is very important. Of course, thinking about some aspect of architecture is important, but understanding tools are equally important. For people who are strong for architecture design, sometimes, yes, if they are the expert of that, indeed, they can focus on that aspect of the design. And without knowing the technology. I also agree with that. Without really understanding the technology today, it's a little bit dangerous if you are trying to be capable of something you do, right? You know, it's different that you know it and then you choose not to use it. That is different from not knowing it and don't apply to it. I think that is very different. So for those, I will say people need to know and learn a little bit about what's happening today because the technology changed so much. But in terms of how they use it, they don't have to do scripting. They don't have to do parametric modeling. They don't need to do that. But the system and thinking 
should be there if there is a benefit. So for instance, in ZHA, not everyone can do parametric modeling. Not everyone knows about scripting. However, one thing I discovered is that systematic thinking and also this data-driven uh, thinking is in every project. Lay alone, the project is done completely manually, traditionally. It doesn't really matter. But the way how the project is realized, it's always connect to that process. For Can you me, give us an example of that process? Do you mean more how you're thinking about the shaping conceptual design or during the competition phase? And then that somehow translates to how it's being rationalized? Mm. That aspect, yes, that aspect, yes, but not only that. When you design something, you basically already think about potential issues that you, you will get into. And therefore, when you design something, you already semi process that kind of information as a constraint of your design. And I think that is very important. And the reason I said this, because again, most people designer focus on graphical design and think that maybe you have a consultant to be on board and deal with this particular problems. And then the reason why... I would be one of those people that thinks exactly in that way. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> yeah, but I just feel that you should be able to control your design much more because architects like to complain about consultants, how consultants change your design. Architects like to complain about builders or contractors, how they execute your design. However, before complaining all these things, you need to know why. You need to know. Why. But that's where technology has to also be met with experience, right? In a larger office, you might have a couple of people with more experience that could assist you, even if you're you know, driving the design direction or trying to rationalize it, understanding how things get built and maybe even like the process of more complex panels and how they get shipped and how they get assembled and what kind of details they need to, that's actually quite important where perhaps architects with less experience have less exposure to that field of the industry. Yes, definitely. I think that is one of the problems within architecture because architecture projects are extremely complicated. The parties involved in the process are extremely diverse and every project is very unique and specific as well. And therefore, architecture experience is something that cannot be shared easily, although it's possible. But in general, you only get guidance when there is a specific problem. When there is a problem you cannot solve, then probably in a big office, senior people will say, oh, actually, I encountered this problem before. You can deal with this in this way or that way, right? That is where the, the knowledge is shared. But when the problem doesn't exist, then you wouldn't be able to understand this larger framework of a project. Uh, but actually that exists. Uh, for me, I think this is something I also try to make it more transparent, make it more accessible for people because, you know, you are an architect. You don't really know about what a building is made to different phases or what kind of challenges. I feel that is a little bit dangerous. We can put a lot of emphasis on design, but at the same time, you put risk on the project in many ways, right? You put the risk on the it's client. It's tricky though, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, I think I, th I think it's tricky. It's, it's in, in, indeed tricky. It depends what kind of emphasis we want to put, especially in architecture academia, right? We focus more on the thinking side of the space, right? Try to understand spatial quality, try to understand all different aspects of a space that we could produce and have an impact on a larger urban fabric or society in many ways. And those are the focus in most architecture education, which is completely relevant and important. However, when you deal with a project, then other aspects will kick in apart from that, right? Sometimes it's to do with a specific typology function or a specific constraint as well. And those things not 
articulate in academia. And therefore, there is always a gap between academia and profession, which causes that kind of struggles for people. It's very tricky because you just cannot learn everything in one during limited time, right? We have five years education or maybe four years or three years. Something you just have to go with experience. So that's why it's very difficult for the technology to be more democratized in many ways for people. You can democratize processes. Right? We already did that, right? Oh no, that in an architecture project should go with, for example, like a conceptual design, SD schematic design, detailed development, construction, all these kind of things. We already try to classify our production in many ways and then focus on different type of problems we need to need to solve. However, with technology today, this process can be further articulate and it can be further democratized so that those issues or complaints could be probably tackled better. It's a really a fragile industry and very hard to... But one of the guests that I was speaking to very soon is somebody called Ryan Schultz. And because I'm part of the online open source design community and from websites like osarc.org, where we talk a lot about different kind of opening, democratizing, I really like that word, especially in the ages we live now, where it seems like there's a political shift the other way. Anyways, so within their practice, it's called opening design. And they actually put up very good details, like rather details of building components together for a library that anybody can like utilize and or use it either as a template or to develop a design further. Or sometimes we may not have experience with the specific idea detail and we might need some guidance to understand how those details can come together. So it's wonderful to see that there's actually even a further democratization that's happening with design, especially on the construction side of things. Yeah, and then also, we always talk a lot about this within a technology group. We are not, uh, we uh, as architects, we are not good at sharing information. We are not, we are not good at sharing processes as well. Yeah, quite often we claim that is IP, but that is not a true IP because, you know, like if you look at software side, right? If you can do a specific function, it doesn't make the software, right? <laughs> and but because of the whole changing of the industry so for example like a, it's also to do with this computational design term right it's new so a lot of offices use that as a way to communicate with their clients or to to brand their office in order to deliver a stylistic sort of a message to people. We are a parametric design office, so that means we are able to create maybe something more efficiently or something more of a geometry articulate type of project, for instance, this kind of stuff. However, these kind of things are changing because the software is more open than before. Now even like Rhino and Ravi completely two different uh, platforms. Uh, people are talking to each other and people are working together with each other to really make things more accessible for each. And that is really the, a good start. But the whole industry need to share more information so that uh, it can really push the profession uh, faster. And that is exactly what AI does to now it's still in very early stage, but people start using, uh, for example, a chat GPT with basically all sorts of software. And that is a very good start of something because when the software get better, that means you know, the software get more data and then people have to share more data, right? So in order to make the software better, this is a two-way conversation and people need to be willing to share that information. However, when we share information, we have a specific format to deal with. But when you deal with software, what people are not really aware of is that they are actually sharing that process with the software because it's two ways. You cannot just assume that this, the software will know everything, right? It's not possible. Software is searching for a certain pattern and try to predict something based on historical data and so on, which we call trend data, right? I, I see this changing today because uh, people 
got amazed by this kind of software and then people are using it, implementing it, and that means people are sharing with it. I really look forward to uh, in another like two or three years time when the software like this can start understand the problem. At the moment, you understand ge geometrical problem. Uh, you say, okay, I actually want to create this and can you just put out a command and execute that for me? You can, right? But this is still detached from the process of a specific profession, right? Yeah, likely you know, there'll be some companies that jump on board and start to train it on data sets that are more specific to, let's say, architecture. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. That is where the profession will be more integrated. Of course, we cannot be an expert of everything. But as I say, we should be aware of different things. I think architecture today is much more connected than ever. Of course, maybe if you refer to the master builder, that is a different thing. But I think we are like a returning to, to that kind of very similar things nowadays with all these kind of a digital tool assets. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm totally with you on the fact that we as architects don't share nearly as much as we should amongst each other to learn from each other's challenges and mistakes and learning paths. But it's also different working in a practice with endless deadlines. The clients are also aware of the technological changes, so they understand that they can also demand more from a lot of what the architects produce. And then there's also NDAs, right, which sometimes can last tens of years before you're able to publicly talk about an, a project. So it becomes quite difficult in many situations to actually share the essential data and you know, information and experience from working on a project in a specific way that helps move the whole industry forward. Yes, yes, definitely. It's very difficult. As I mentioned, it's really specific. And also maybe in, in the past, you work as a residential architect, then you might only folk, you, are, you might only know everything about a residential architecture. You might not be able to know, for example, a stadium, or you might not know about hospital, you might not know about office and so on. I think that is how the profession work in the past but now today you can see like offices do all sort of things today it's very important to get awareness of all these things then and that is basically why i do so much education or what i do a bunch of different things it's essentially for me to really understand the difficulties of this profession and how to basically not really propose a solution for it. It's really difficult, but to raise awareness of it and then try to do things slightly differently. Yeah. So jumping up to a different topic slightly here. So you work in Zaha, so it's very difficult for me not to ask you, do you have experience with Maya or do you get Maya models? What did you have to rationalize then or what is the workflow? With Maya, do you have any, do you even touch Maya? In your day yeah, -to -day? definitely. Maya is a fantastic tool for design exploration. It's really easy to use and it's really iterative so that you can explore design aesthetics, like a proportion, or you can explore ideas very quickly. Maya is a software our office use a lot, no matter if it's for competition or commission projects, that is basically where the ideas start. Of course, not everything knows how to use Maya, but Maya is still take a lot of uh, places in the office. And apparently Maya has its own limitation and then you might need other workflows such as Rhino Grasshopper to jump in to rationalize the geometry and so on. You might need other software that do better visualization to jump in. You might want to communicate um, your design in very specific way uh, with VR and so on. It's really about how you communicate information with others and then choose the right platform to use. But if you talk about Maya specifically, right, and then you talk about design specifically, okay, like the visualization, like the experience side of things, then the workflow is apparent Maya modeling and then to 
Rhino Grid support for rationalization, for data extraction, for maybe planning a little bit. And then when something is not working or not need to be adjusted, then you might feed the information back to Maya to, to do all sort of adjustments. So it's really this of a back and forth, a back and forth a workflow between two softwares and take the advantage of each basically. Maya is very interesting how it got started with Zaha because it was like maybe the, one of the first softwares that the designers that were working with Zaha in mid to late 90s got their hands on and they were like, wow, we can actually start to express some of those designs. Do you think a company like Zaha, if it were starting today, instead of 30 years ago, or it started even longer, but let's say 30 years ago is when Zaha started getting commissions. So do you think if there is a company today in a similar situation, like Zaha was 30 years ago, that what Maya was capable to do for them could potentially be done by different software, let's say like Blender? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Now that there are so many software available, right? Autodesk is one of the biggest player in terms of this kind of graphical software for designer. That is just due to the whole history of software development. And they, they've been working on not just one particular type of software. They have so many different connected software as well to 2D process, 3D, to from architecture to CGI to automotive industry as well. So their software are really capable for people to use to articulate certain type of design problems and very flexible ever however because of the whole history of it therefore you also come with in accessibility for people nowadays right especially for students to start although they provide really good educational package for people but other software might be able to um, do very similar things and might also be more accessible more open in many ways to help people to pursue more of a customized workflow because we've been talking about how important it is to be able to understand your software to customize to look at the problem that you really want to deal with and then try to have a feedback to your the software that you use so create these kind of a two ways of conversation if i am going to pick a software that can do very similar things with maya that could be blender I see Blender as a kind of a software that not only does what Maya can do, but also do something what maybe Rhino and Grasshopper can do. Just purely because of the openness. I personally don't use Blender, but it's important for me to really understand what is available, what are the technologies. I do look into the software and I, I find it really in line with what I mentioned earlier, be open, also has really powerful capability for design iteration. And also you are able to customize it, to hook up with other processes, similar to what Resubbit does. Of course, it's a polygon modeling tool therefore the 2d aspect could be a bit weaker than rhino and grasshopper however because it's a open software therefore you are able to extend that functionality there is no reason you cannot bring in the 2d aspect of function to that software it's just like how the software is understood by people and then how people would like to basically use it and push it in their own profession when the time is right i believe that this software could be really powerful and when people understand a little bit because i say most software today is understood as a graphical software to start with right but once they bypass that stage that is where the life of the software will be extended right you, for example like rhino grasshopper but maya stays let's say in the concept design spectrum right like people don't use maya to rationalize geometries they use maya to do design concepts yes or no you it's a 3d software it's a, a software and a software that means it's create based on certain mathematical logic, right? To be realized as a computer graphic. Therefore, you can always make things precise, right? You can always assess those functionality, but it depends on how 
open it is. It depends on how easy it is. It depends on what kind of library you use in first place and how accessible it is to other people. So for instance, now Maya has the Python and Mail, these two languages, right? Previously, when Python is not the main language used in Maya, then obviously people has to learn this mailed language, which is foreign for most people because Python language, C Sharp, all these kind of language, you can find a lot of resource online, which make it more open for people. But the mail language is not. And therefore, there are limited number of people who can do it. Uh, with that language to rationalize. However, having said that, like uh, even 10 years ago, I've been seeing people from CGI doing crazy male language to control uh, all these kind of amazing CGI images, right? Control how the card explodes, all these kind of uh, animation theme. So that can really be done. But however, it's new. Controlling the software in this kind of a customized way is very new for the architecture. It's very new for architecture. Therefore, we rely heavily on the sources online to, to learn, to get our head around completely different ways of thinking into the computational logic. And therefore, the software is used in a specific way, but potentially it's possible. So the, I actually learned Python with Maya over 10 years ago. So it's been around for a while and it's the API is just almost like writing script syntax. It's very easy to work with, right? It's very straightforward. And in Blender, it is indeed so open that there's a couple of very interesting things that are happening. First off, Blender has Furchok, which is the Russian word for grasshopper. So that's like a, a community plugin for Blender, which is pretty much replicating most of the utilities that grasshopper has. And they've also incorporated an open source NURBS library. So you can do NURBS in Blender with Svirchok without having a full NURBS modeling software. On the other hand, again, because of the openness of the software and the community behind it, there's a plugin called Blender BIM, which is part of OpenIFC. And what that allows you to do is natively edit an IFC. So Blender is in this case is just the interface. But what they've started integrating now is also documentation, which is where it's going to get quite interesting because somehow Blender, for some people, could be the software in which you both design but also document your project. Yes, definitely. So like the more open the software is, the more accessible it become for people and easier ad adaptation it could happen for sure. And, and, you know, I see that potential with a uh, Blender, but of course it depends on how fast the community uh, can push this uh, software forward because it's also to do with what is available there. User friendliness is very important. Or so you can no. have all the tools, but you have to code them all on your own or half of them at least. Then that's time that you would rather spend actually using another tool. Yeah, because it, the, the time matters really, because the, for example, like when those environmental simulation, like ladybug, butterfly, and dragonfly, all these kind of interesting insect entering the world of grasshopper, right? All the specialists in profession start entering to this design world. People are scared because there's always a question of how much we can rely on the result of it. Is it just someone who created this software uh, or plugin to, to simulate in a way that is useful for design, but not really for an uh, analytic purpose and how much you can really re rely on it. And only time can prove that. And then only adaptation. Or if engineering companies behind it or an engineer, you can <laughs> trust it a little bit more. Yes, of course. But like, for example, Karimba, right? Karimba is a, a structured plugin for Grasshopper. Nowadays, people are still arguing the limitation of that and how well that can be implemented in the whole structure calculation process because it's a liability. It's about life as well, right? You and I both know a lot very good engineers in London like AKT2 and Format that are more than happy to utilize the, those tools and use their prior experience as a benchmark to understand whether what those softwares provide are rational or not. Yeah, exactly. 
that is achievable for sure. But the difference is that we use some software like TechLot, uh, on those kind of CFD software, which has um, industry proof already. Therefore, you don't even need to think about these kind of liability things of your data, right? You don't need to question the, the output of your simulation, right? You don't need to be thinking more to do with, okay, if there, there are things you have to comply, so you have to be aware of, you basically just use the software as is, right? But with all these kind of open software, then that always poses a question. Right? I always pose a question. You have to think about it. And a company who really employed a specific software into a design workflow or into a certain process, then require a big discussion, right? Sometimes even choosing what software for the company, it's a big thing to discuss, right? So I think Blender has that kind of opportunity, but it depends on how much recognition you know, the community has with the software and what kind of things can be really brought into that software, then that will really push the software into the use of different ways. And I think that is where the software could probably happen more right now in Grasshopper. In Grasshopper, now, nowadays, Grasshopper 2 is available, but people debate and argue a lot because it's a software, if, even though it's based on Rhino, again, similar to the Grasshopper we use, however, it's a rewritten platform. Therefore, people cannot really use any of the functionality from Rhino, uh, from Grasshopper 1 in Grasshopper 2. This is a big debate because transferring those processes, those, you know, different things people developed over years in Grasshopper 2 could be very challenging. And therefore, um, it's a method of time, but people still look at what is capable of doing instead of really you know, put their hands on the development side of it, because it, it will really come down to you know, like how accessible it is and what kind of functionality and what kind of process. You wouldn't be able to jump into that and then only, again, deal with maybe only early stage of design, right? Because you have to deal with the latest stage design or post-processing of a lot of things, which if you cannot really do it with the software, then I don't know how fast the industry can adopt that software. It's more about AEC professionals experimenting with different tools that will bring those tools on board for even more people to consider them as viable alternatives to whatever is available out there. Yes, definitely. Apparently, Rhino is also aware of the developments of all different types of software, know the capability of each, and therefore they also try to bring in more. For example, um, in Rhino 7, the latest version, uh, SubD has been brought in. Rhino is never a, a kind of a pull and push software like Blender or Maya, but now that capability is there, right? Although it's limited at the moment, if that is something what people need, then it will get uh, developed a bit further. And also like in Rhino WIP version, this kind of mechanism is applied to the nerve geometry as well, which is what we think not possible in the past, but not, this is not limited to sub D or polygon modeling, it's possible in, uh, for those kind of mathematically defined geometry, which is a big plus. So I think the in the end probably is a competition <laughs> between different software that bring in like a more accessibility to people. Great. So switching gears again here a little bit, I wonder if we can talk about the most challenging project that you have worked on or at the same time, or a different project, which may be the one that you're the most proud of that you can talk about. Most challenging project. I think every project has different challenges. It's more to do with a project that has, that focus more on design. Then I think, I mean, there are so many projects I can think of. I couldn't say which one is more challenging than others, but I have to say a lot of my early projects in other offices are actually more challenging than maybe those like a large scale projects I deal with in 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 those uh, big offices. Yeah, because big offices has a well defined work scope uh, liability, and therefore the extent of uh, your work 
is limited by the stage of work in, in many ways. So even we talk about the integration between different processes, different stage of work, and then you might add complexity to that process and so on to complicate basically your own design articul articulation process. However, that is purely the challenge of the scale. It's not really the challenge of things such as reinventing the wheel. A lot of projects I did in small office, they are more artistic projects or they are projects that use completely non-standard material to create. Those projects for me are the most challenging one because there is no standard. And then you have to define and argue for that standard which is tricky because if there is a rule, you follow the rule, you get a tick or not. But if there is no, uh, no such rule, then you have to fight for the recognition of certain things. I can refer to a, a project like I, I worked probably back in 2015, University Campus Project, which we we trying to basically create this kind of a crazy jump with non-standard panel types. And then we have a really interesting concept to scatter light from exterior to light and use that to drive basically the interior planning where we focus on maybe the function or the program of the space and see how that can be reflected to the external facade and so on. It's completely an opposite process where we want to really rethink about a space that can be planned differently based on the specific context. In order to achieve that, we have to actually completely bespoke the project in a way that even need to reinvent how the material can be certified because it's a public building. It's to do with a number of stuff that need to be complied. And therefore, that project, we have to fight for that kind of things a lot and have proof it. And we have to conduct analysis and so on to really prove that things can be comply with industrial standard. So this actually also brings to something that we discussed earlier. Computational design is not just about designing things. I mentioned about communication, but I didn't really elaborate too much about that because quite often we cannot really push a, a certain design further not simply because of technicality of it, not because you, you cannot do this geometry, you cannot do that, you cannot rationalize it to a certain extent where which it falls into a certain budget and so on. It's also to do with liability and risk management because, for example, that project requires a 10 years warranty on the material, but the industry doesn't produce that kind of a bespoke panels, which we have to digitally customize it and we have to do it in a, a specific way in order to reflect that design intent in, in order to make sense of our proposal and so on. And in, in that case, if that method of working cannot be linked to the design process, then the, for us, the project fail, basically, right? In the end, we cannot get certification for that because the project has only two years time. And then that certification process requires five years or to 10 years time to be well rounded it's proof, then no, it's, it's a little bit like medicine in a way, right? You really have to test it. You really to have to understand what it means in different scenarios, in terms of fire, in terms of daylight, in terms of all sorts of issues that might create for the interior participants. Sounds so like on. we need a crisis because if there is a crisis, then things get certified, let's say, a little bit faster because yeah. of the demand. Yeah, and therefore the challenge of that, that, those kind of projects not really on the design part, it's really to bring all these things to people, to council. They don't really understand why you need that, why you cannot just purchase something that has a 10 years warranty already and that make the liability so clear. Maintenance could be also issue. Okay, so you are a design company. Right. This is all to do with uh, the structure of the profession as well. Right. Okay. You do this design and then what happened if this happened? Are you taking the liability of the company who produced the material or the company who post process it or, or the university or who? How do we really define that? The challenge of those kind of projects are not on the design, are not on the process, but really to push a certain type of understanding to people. I, I didn't do this kind of project in those like big offices, mostly have for those kind of small projects, because that also gives us a room to basically push different ideas. 
It's a very interesting topic because if we look specifically at Zaha and the office and the work, in many ways it changed the architecture profession. And the primary change it had, according to me, is not so much about design, but more about design construction and using different kinds of materials and different ways to panelize things. Now, before Zaha, nobody was doing that. And people were afraid. And now everybody's doing that. And our engineers have gotten a little bit better and more sophisticated as well to be able to realize some of the structures that come out from an office like Zaha. So it, it is possible. It's not easy. It has to be done with people that are big risk takers, right? Or smaller projects. Yeah, exactly. It, it's completely possible if you say, okay, look, I take full liability, okay? Then I do what I want. Yes. You can, but <laughs> that, that, never that happens, is, though, but... it never happened. Exactly. It never <laughs> yeah. happens. Yeah. But that is why, that is why it's so difficult. You have to fight for it. You have to say, Hey, we only do this whole thing. We only process your material in this way and that way. And it really you know, fall out of the range of how you basically get your uh, product satisfied, uh, certify, right? So we can prove that process for you. And then you can use that to, uh, to get the, uh, your product uh, certified and then, and warranty our project. And then people will say, Oh, no, we, we don't know what you do with that. So we cannot take the liability for you. So that is... And that's yeah. why they say that it takes a great architect and client team to develop great projects because you have to also have perhaps a client who's willing to take a bit more risk than a typical client working with either an up-and-coming designer or utilizing new innovative construction and material methods. Exactly. It's difficult. And I appreciate like how our office pushed the design, pushed the industry, really. People really want to execute ZHA's project, really want to realize it. And then quite often, it's really down to this, what I say, maybe when people don't care what it takes to do it, then that is where the innovation happens or could potentially exactly. happen. Exactly. I don't see that is easy. I don't see that is easy. Yeah. Just due to my rule, we have to really fight with well-structured companies. In the previous one, which we don't have that capability to, to fight for it. And therefore, we push hard to a certain extent and then and we give up, right? But for ZA, because they already have the history that it's possible, right? It's possible. So it's much easier to prove that to a company that is well structured, established, and they have their own process. And also it's also to do with the context of the project in Europe in particular, it will be difficult, right? But in a place where things can be a little bit of flexible, then it's possible. Most of the, our projects are in China, a different country operates slightly differently and therefore what we enjoy a lot is that kind of a flexibility in, in that specific country so that maybe something does have a constraint uh, there is a regulation but you are able to challenge it you are able to prove it in a way that is still possible and that is why it basically push the innovations this is also a kind of a two-way things so once there is a proof in one country then you know you are able to bring that standard that production process or that kind of work work methods to other countries too because there is a proof it is very unique and i totally agree with you it does push or change the AEC a lot it's not easy i believe that it, it, it must be a lot of fight in the very beginning beginning i'm sure you know about the cardiff opera controversy yeah where zaka won the project but the board basically said or the municipality i forget exactly the story that no we can't trust this architect to build that for us because you know, they don't have the history i'm sure they're quite sorry looking back at it now we probably would have put cardiff on a world map like Bilbao has been with the Guggenheim Museum there, but that's what happens when you take risks sometimes. It pays off in huge dividends. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, 
A few things that just cannot be changed. That is just something drive the projects mostly. One is deadline. There is a deadline. A project need to happen. It's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you have a specific purpose to buy a certain project, to use a product for a certain way. So you really need that product at the time. If you miss it, maybe you don't need the product. Deadline is sometimes drive a project a lot. Also drive the process. Like we talk about technology, right? What to choose the right technology. Maybe that is something to do with a deadline, a time frame you, you have. And also another thing is budget. Uh, obviously you can, these two things interconnected, right? Because obviously you have limited budget and then you want to achieve uh, something that is not feasible, then the only way to do that is to put more resource to it, right? Or you reduce the uh, the scope of your work and then achieve something that is a little bit less and off from the design team, right? That's so a I very think... good point. People don't realize that, but good design is expensive. The process of generating and iterating and conceptualizing and the typical design process takes a long time. And there are only certain companies that are willing to invest the resources necessary to get to good design. And not every architecture company cares about good design or wants to show that. So they don't invest the right amount of resources that would require. Yes, I believe that every company want to push good design. I really believe in that. However, it's more to do with the type of client and the type of need. A design company like Zaha, that is just like a really few in the world, right? And even you operate as a design company, right? Sometimes you don't get a chance to choose projects. You have to deal with your day-to-day -day bills and so on. Therefore, you provide this as a service to execute what people need. And in that case, not everyone, not all your clients are aware of what it takes to make the project. They was like, oh, hey, I see, I see that project done this way. I want that. But every project has unique condition, right? And even it might look similar as the result. However, it might take completely different process. And that project has a specific structure behind it so that you can do it in that way, but you don't have. And then you cannot just say, okay, that project is done with X amount of budget. And then this one, we are going to achieve the same outcome, the same budget, the same deadline of, you cannot, but people don't understand it. Right. And this is also very interesting because in the UK, uh, it's really about a compliance of the code. So sometimes people uh, do things by themselves and they don't think there is a need for architect to be involved because all the regulation, everything is very transparent and it's like taking a, a box. But however, that is actually where the problems happen. Right. Yeah, exactly. I wonder if you could speak, maybe we figured that most projects are quite challenging, but what about the one that you're the proudest about? The one that you feel like the output, the input you invested can be really shown off in the output of the actual project. And probably the project I have been working on in ZHA is one of the projects I can be really proud of for a few reasons. I believe that later on you can also share the link with public. It's uh, the presentation was done for a conference in Japan. But What's the, the project the, the, called? A fintech a financial technology tower. In so that project specifically, why I'm proud of it, because it actually, as you, I know, ZHA is really a design company, which means that we probably normally do things until maybe SD or DD stage, and that's it, right? And even it's for DD, we do it to an extent that basically illustrates well about what the project or design intent we have and pretty much it. And then we have partners to execute it. We have our consultants to execute it. We have someone to really manage it, right? And those kind of process are quite linear and traditional. And we thought that is the best way to differentiate our liability and also just in terms of time and budget, right? How we basically locate our resource. And also this is to do with the rule as well, because in, in general, when architect get into that kind of uh, process, you become a principal architect who really just supervise high level of a picture, like how the project is executed. Is there any kind of issue that 
basically conflict with the initial design intent, but in terms of technicality, that is all left to other people. And the project I work on, it's a great achievement in this kind of office, which in many ways transform the role of an architect in the project. We are still principal architects, but we understand that the project we tackle is extremely, extremely complex. And whatever you do, it actually also change the design intent we have, even just moving one tiny things, it could change dramatically the de design intent, which actually is a conflict to what we agree with the clients. And therefore, in order to solve that problem, that particular problem, okay, to make sure that we are not going to have any potential issue with them, of course, you cannot avoid 100%, but you try your best, is really to develop this kind of multi uh, stage integration uh, workflow, which is not typically considered because as I say, you focus on design, you finish your design, you generate gra graphic and that's it. And then you hand over to, to others. But in this particular project, we basically try to pull out as much as our experience uh, from the team, right? Uh, like um, our team, uh, we have people who are in the office for like 15, 20 years who really know what kind of potential issues that could come out and then how a project normally get a stop uh, in halfway and then what kind of fights we get in, into and then or what kind of difficulty the hidden uh, side of architecture exactly the hidden side of so the glamorous architecture we try practice. to anticipate all of that from many levels yeah from the communication we anticipate what kind of com uh, communication that we are going to have down the line from for example, from the, the start point of DD all the way to a construction and what potential issues we are going to have after the use uh, of a building and so on. And then where the arrows of risk normally happens. And therefore, we anticipate those things in such a way that we develop this computational workflow. If you look at how that design model is created, then you will see that, oh, why you have this massive grasshopper script for each process? Why is that? Because you are not capable of simplifying things. You are doing things in a very inefficient way, but actually not like a project that handle basically your five form information for two, three gigabyte that can be executed in just one minute. That basically indicate how efficient the script is. So. That is complicated because we have to really consider all these problems and mention in that process. We need to really learn from those past experience. We have tried to anticipate, okay, what it means if we have to fight for this with the planner, okay, now with the contractor, now with uh, maybe you know, when this problem come out, we have to fight with a planner. How we are going to argue, fight and prove that? Right? For example, if you are going to argue with a contractor, right? They say, okay, actually, we cannot achieve this with this type of specification because budget, because why? So we have to simplify your design. We have to do things in this way. You say, no, actually, let me prove you, right? You tell us how you value engineering, the, the project, right? And then we can do a deep analysis on where the course take place. And then if you are to, going to simplify, we will tell you the way how it could be simplified without conflicting the project intent and so on, right? So this project actually has all these components for crammed together in the process so that even we are at a construction stage at the moment, we can change things in a way that we are doing SD design because quite often you know, these kind of a complicated project will work seamlessly with the entire process. And you know, for example, if you update something, as I say, it has this domino effect of other things. Therefore, maybe one big aspect is that when you do this, you change your building outline and you don't do planning, planning at the construction stage. Typical architectural design process would mean loads. Of, you basically have to rebuild the whole project if that happens. Exactly. Or without computational um, design. Like doing the planning again is not an issue, I have to say. In, in general, it's an issue, of course, and the issue actually come with the process. It's not the issue of doing the planning. You say, okay, you need six more weeks. You need how many weeks? Okay, we got that. 
okay? But the problem is not. Normally, you will drag the project for another year or two just because then it's a linear process. You cannot redo X, Y, Z, and so on, right? And then all the consultant on board is going to redo this work. This is actually the biggest problem. I tell you, now construction stage, we have to redo the planning just because of all changes we made. However, I'm not saying we will be able to get aware of it, but we are minimizing that risk, right? Because we already take what is going to attach to that process into account. And therefore, what we try to do is to ensure that we don't drag a project. We will probably take another maybe six weeks, eight weeks, just for arguing or articulating these changes that we make to the project. But we don't need to repeat any of that process afterward. So for me, this is a great achievement because, because even when we start optimizing the design in respect to all constraints we got at DD stage, you already know that the project, you have to go through that process, right? And then people will say, okay, either we do it or we don't do it. Or maybe you say, hey, ZHA, you finish your contract here, then we're going to ask whoever on board to deal with that problem. You don't care about that. But we want to have a great control over our design, and we want to make sure that we not get into a conversation which a client receive a product, receive what they ask for, and then start questioning your design. We know that this is a two different conversation. Design is one thing, execution is another thing, but normally clients don't really understand that. Whatever happens during the construction stage, then they plan. Obviously, people like to blame each other, right? So in the end, that plan could go all the way back to the designer and say, hey, actually, because the decision is made in that very first place, that's why we have all these associated problems. And that is what we try to avoid because we think that we understand that client don't understand, right? The client don't understand. So we take that already into account to avoid that kind of things. Although, again, I say... We are not going to 100% avoid those issues, but we will sure. minimize it. That's fantastic. So it, there's an embedded design intelligence in the computational model that you've built, which goes back to one of the discussions that we had earlier, uh, that these days we're not only designing the design, but we're designing the workflows, right? So in your case, you've designed a workflow which embeds the design intelligence that can impact the actual design from many different aspects, communications, handoffs, and so on. And another interesting aspect from what you described is actually that you've created your own bespoke Katia-like workflow, where Katia is inherently parametric too. In other words, the parametricism doesn't get in the way of the designer. You don't need to know anything, although they now have the capability to do that. But you could have one perimeter curve that drives the whole footprint of the design and drives the shape and then drives the panelization, then drives how you label your panels, there's the sizes, the typical sizes and so on. So if you go back and you change your perimeter curve, it, the idea is that the whole design then updates itself appropriately all the way down to the nuts and bolts as they would like to say. So it sounds like you've built a pretty cool bespoke version of that. Yeah, that is the parametric modeling as aspect. Yeah, that is indeed. But another aspect which I, I haven't really touched on is really the collaboration aspect, right? So that is what people are afraid of. When you build a completely bespoke and heavy process, then look, if, for example, if someone is going to jump on board, where are they going to start? And then you know, if there are separate studies that need to be done, and how that can be done and implemented if there is a change that needs to be made. So all these things need to be considered as well, right? Like, for example, we talk about if you get a chance to listen to the, the presentation, every geometry we have within that building requires a separate study because different angle of the building require different method of construction, for example, a specific type of curve 
right? You cannot have the same curve from one place to another just because of how different intensity you get. And that has a great impact on the aesthetics. We all know like when you draw a line slightly differently, you get completely different proportion in space. So same for the curve, right? And therefore every corner of the building and every condition is that to do with flat 2D sort of the glazing behind or is it at the corner with a little bit of chamfer or is it to do with a concave convex a glass with a certain reflectivity and angle then we have to deal with them all separately so those cannot be done with one single process and also they cannot be done based on our assumption because it's also to do with the fabrication constraint it's to do with the material itself Therefore, all of them require completely separate studies. The framework we develop allows someone to jump into different process and control from a sort of a global manner, right? So from the design manner, it says, okay, actually, from overall appearance, we have to insert a, f uh, a fire door here just because of maybe on the orientation of the building, the layout, the program people put there, or be maybe because of the density of the people in there. So we, we get all these kind of requests at different stage, right? Because the interior design team jump in, or like a client want to change the use of the building and so on. Then you keep receiving this kind of request. For us as a design company, we don't really allow this kind of technical issue to ruin the design. We say, okay, actually you need to have these uh, fire doors. Oh, you don't have a space here at this location. Then we just punch your building and insert that door. No, what we end up with is, okay, look, you want to insert this door, it's possible. But what that means is we have to iterate through the entire facade, change it. And then as you might see the building, when you change one single lines because the penalization of the glazing layer, the mullion, the louver, and so on, they are all connected. So once you change that, the whole building outline is changed. And then that even more complicated by the connection to the landscape and interior because all the lines flow continuously to the landscape and interior in both direction, right? So that means that the entire project will need to be redone. And therefore, this kind of collaborative workflow and how all these processes can be assessed in real time, it becomes a matter. And the success of all these accommodation of different criteria and question is really dependent and defined by these articulate computational framework. So this is something I haven't really seen much in architecture. I've been involved in computational design for 13 years. I am really proud of it. Really proud of it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Hopefully you know, this kind of framework that you talk about could get incorporated into more projects, maybe at Zaha or maybe elsewhere. For young students, or for professionals that maybe don't know, they hear about parametric design, they hear about computational design. What do you suggest they start with? Should they take a course, watch specific videos, they try to execute like on a specific project? How do you suggest that people start acquiring some of those skills that sound so much like they are becoming more and more essential? I think that's a fantastic question. You get your architectural education in the school and then you will have the tools you learn from the school to articulate your ideas. So those are given based on your education in the school. However, one thing that is not really given is the experience, which you can only learn from the office you work or the projects that you work on. Because it's not about picking up which tool if we talk about a software, then the device I will give is to pick up a tool that probably can address the majority of potential problems, right? It just has this capability for you to address them when it comes. This link back to willingness of sharing, right? One thing that we don't do is sharing. One thing we don't do is for young professional, young graduate students, the patient should really go beyond design. Right? Try to understand what it really means to build a building or, or to create architecture, right? What it really means. Because we don't you don't look into that until you are asked to start making detail join. You start looking at, at those things. And then most office they say they don't want to kill the creativities of the people just fresh out from the school. For 
people who get into the profession, maybe if you are passionate about architecture or design, you should really take a chance to learn more about this profession. So my suggestion will be attend CBD courses to really know. Sometimes it's a bit boring. You say, okay, I don't care about that glass. I don't care about that construction method because it's too far from me. That has been probably the biggest learning for me after getting into any of the office. I really love to sit in a CPT that not talk about, maybe even just toilet, right? Oh, actually, that is something that could drive my project completely differently just because how the surfacing system is implemented in the design and so on, right? And what I need to consider because that might just pop up at some point and ruin the whole design and the whole design changes could be made dependent on that. Same for mechanical system and so on. This is just an example. But what I am trying to say is that you have to really ask questions. I don't see that kind of patient in young professionals. They are super excited about the project. They get their hands on. But I don't see that people are passionate about that. And I don't think the office made people aware of that kind of aspect as well. Just because, for example, like maybe in the UK, a lot of people and also those people who graduate maybe from a school of architecture or Bali school of architecture, they get into a super big firm like international firm and you know then in those kind of you know, super big firm you work on specific thing maybe this uh, suggestion i give that come from my experience working in very small firm when i first uh, started my career in the uk i work in a firm just with one person that's it and then the, the office grew to 10, grew, grew to 15 people and so on before jumping into big office, like 800 people, 500 people, this kind of office. And therefore, for me, I, I, I have to straight away tackle all aspects of a building, right? Because of limited resource, and I, I really need to know what it means. Because those clients can go away very easily. They say, okay, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. You cannot go there and say, okay, we are going to work out a design and then tell you what the budget is. The clients are, hey, look, this is my budget. Okay, so this is a building we want, and then we want these references and so on, right? You can ask, okay, we need to think, we need to do these. I, I totally get it because. First off, I started within a really small office myself as well, with only three people, back when I was still an undergraduate in the US. So you do get to learn a lot on there because you're asked to do part of everything, right? You don't just do one thing, you do a lot of things. But in bigger offices, it, it sounds like what you're saying is to be more proactive about the overall design direction of the project. and. It's sometimes difficult because over the years, having worked with a lot of part ones and part two, so for those from outside of the UK, those are either people that are still in their education or fresh graduates, they come with the idea that you know, they're very competent designers and they quickly realize they're not. So they have to almost make up for what they don't know by appearing that they do know it. So there's a bit of that kind of a, how shall I say it, brashness attitude in a way where, uh, okay, we are expected to know everything. So of course we know everything. So we're not going to ask questions about anything because then we look like we don't know anything. So there's a little bit of that as well, which is that facade in a way where we have to, as professionals, especially younger professionals, they think that they really need to know everything. Whereas in reality, part ones and part twos, they don't know anything in a way. You know, like we have to train them so much. Sure, people that have a little bit more experience, they have passed through a postgraduate program. You know, when they come in an office, they they already have a bit more experience. They have more knowledge, you know, different softwares and things like that. Maybe they don't know exactly like the workflow of the office, but they have a mindset, like you were saying, maybe a computational mindset, or otherwise where they try to pick things up and maybe that's what it is about is having like what you're saying is having that m more open mindset about the fact that there are more alternative ways to solve a problem not just like one specific way to solve a problem
Yeah, exactly. I think that awareness should also be made from the company. Companies should also put an effort to it and then highlight the importance and highlight the difference from education in the school and then telling how important it is and what the value of it. Yeah, because I think for young professional, they perceive architecture really differently. And then also, as you say, I totally agree with you. Design is not everything. And every decision you make is part of the design. Right. So every iteration you are going to do, every constraint, a requirement you are going to accommodate, that is also part of design. The design constraint is not just simply a site analysis, right? Knowing where you can assess the building or just run environmental analysis, getting some beautiful colors and then start using them as the base of design. Those are all right. No problem. However, that is what school um, teach, but in reality, right, you are basically in charge of a space where people are going to occupy. It's not a temporary space, it's a permanent space. And therefore, of course, there are more constraints, there are more parameters to take into account. And I don't see that have the conflict of designing, having more parameters don't really mean that you have a kind of a rigid constraint for your project. If you try to ignore it, then I think, I don't want to say this, but in a way you are cheating, right? Because that means that at certain process, you have to revisit them and then revisit them to solve it at the stage where you can already consider them, then, I think this is down to the experience. It's really down to how competent a person is as an architect to really tackle that. Very similar to, we talk a lot about technology, right? Like why we need optimization workflow, why we need rationalization. That is because we are not competent enough to make the right decision from the very first place when we try to articulate our design with the tool. Right. You know, at that point, I have a different mindset as well, which is one of, okay, in the beginning of a design, you have to try in many different ways. And it doesn't make sense at that point to rationalize all the different possibilities of addressing that design challenge. So that's why you try something and it's a bit more conceptual with the idea that, yes, we will have the time later down the line to make it actually work. Yeah, definitely. So, but what I mean is that once now, whatever you try, you have that embedded. If it's just a method of fine tuning the numbers, then to get that geometry rationalized, that is what I refer to having the computational design mindset strategy embedded in the design process already, leading along that the number is completely random. Yeah, agreed with that completely. It's just having that sort of mindset, which, as you say, doesn't get picked up in traditional education. You, where do you pick it up then? I guess you have to pick it up on the job or through your own yes. ambitions or through your own experience in a way. Yeah, definitely. I think as I mentioned already, I am quite lucky, quite really lucky to be able to do multiple things at the same time and also to basically put myself in the context outside architecture a lot. I, I work with contractor. I work with all projects in different scales, different type of projects, I different computational design projects as well. It's not easy because those are the things that you don't know, you don't know. You don't experience, you don't know. And maybe on this note, another suggestion I can also give is that there are a lot of great conferences and also a lot of online education it's unlikely that we finish our education from the school and that's it. I, I, I it don't never think finishes. So. You never finish. I, I don't think it ever finishes. No, you, you have never to. finish it. Like that, There's always right? like new tools. There's always new ways to think about approaching a similar problem. You yeah, have to it, pick up your skills. So you mentioned already one idea is lunch courses, right? Which are yeah. provided yeah. by your offices. But on top of that, I definitely agree. You just you, you have to keep learning. There's no way around it in one way or another, whether it's like management skills or design skills or project or contractual skills. There's so many different ways right, in whatever people are interested, but totally agree. Exactly. I still, I am a student. 
I have to tell you, I'm a student of many things. I am a teacher, but I'm a student because for me, those things actually inspire me the most. Yes, every company, they depend on the company. They might make you aware of certain things a bit more here and there. But at the same time, there are a lot of things going on, especially on the tech side. Architecture technology changed a lot. So for instance, now that we talk about AI, well, if you look at all the examples on the internet, maybe you think that is a bit useless at the moment, right? But I, I think it's not about using it now or after. It, it's about the understanding of it and the, the potential of it. One thing I enjoy the most with McNeil training is that I've been training people who use this software for 10 years, 15 years. And you know, the conversation with them is incredible. Right, because they are talking about their own experience using the tool, dealing with their own clients, dealing with their own profession. But at the same time, they are also here to learn something, to question you something. That kind of learning really helped me a lot. I teach them the te uh, technicality side of the software, but at the same time, they teach more about the hidden side of what the software is capable of and then how they really use the, the tool to solve their own problems. That's eye-opening. And then a lot of things one profession is looking at can be adopted to a, another profession that doesn't look at the problem in a, a similar way. And those kind of courses, conference and network really help to bring those ideas together. So that is another suggestion I would be giving to like young graduate. You never finish your learning. Could Not be... only for young graduate, even more so, I would say, for established professionals. Yes, even for people who operate offices. A lot of people who came to my course, they are basically in charge of the office. They really want to know how they should invest a resource to new technology. Right, they, they, you know, they came to the course. They not necessarily follow all the like a technical sort of instruction, but they try to understand that is really enjoyable. Although sometimes you see that people are not following your course, but they sit back, they look at, okay, what you do here, uh, how can you do it? They ask you those questions. Can you implement this in this context? How do you deal with it if you have this problem? They are able to zoom out from looking at specific technique. That is a very enjoyable process. And that is why I've been teaching the Grasshopper Rhino course for over 13 years. Great. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And is there anything, upcoming events or anything else you would like to mention as closing notes? For those who would like to learn things that we discussed today to really understand a little bit more about computational design and enhance your, for example, parametric modeling and design capability, I do have a number of courses that are coming up really soon in April and in May. So where do people find those courses? Is it going to be like on McNeil's website or on your own website? I collaborate with a, a lot of different platforms and institutions. The one I'm talking about specifically is for the course I do for this platform called Dizact. And the yeah, website Dizact. is dizact.org. And there is a computational session. And I believe that this course is specifically classified under that because Dizact does architectural education. It does design and build a program and so on. But this one is specifically classified as a computational course. My course is never just about technical quality. It's really about the context, how we understand the software workflow in an architecture and profession so that People who attend the course will get to know everything we discuss. And I have lots of examples to show you about this way beyond just the software. That's great. Thanks very much for letting us know about that upcoming course. And again, thank you so much for being a guest. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dimita. And thank you, everyone, for listening to us. The UH Studio Architecture podcast talks about architecture, computational design and open source tools and how all these three elements can work together to improve design within the architecture field. If you would like to support the work that we do, you can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash uhstudio.